morning, everyone. Morning, Northside Christian Church. We're glad you're here today to, on this beautiful Sunday and uh, fellowship together. Uh, let us uh, go to a, the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful that we can be here today, that we come in your house and worship you, and uh, we can bring all of our trials and tribulation to you. Forgive us where we fall short. Just give us the strength that we need to get through these days, Father, for these things. That's my son's name. Amen.
today's scripture is Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us.
have nothing new to tell you this morning, just to remind you that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus prayed for himself in John 17, 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and said, Father, the time has come to glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now this is eternal life, that you may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you came to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. There's a great song that I really like. It was sung by the Gators, probably in 1950, 1960, but it has a tremendous meaning. He said, I rose among the thorns. While strolling through the fields of time, there's many things you see, but the nature is the greatest sight that there ever be. One day among the world of thorns, the rose began to grow. It was the greatest gift of God this world would ever know. It was the will of God to show that since the world was formed, there had to be a rose to live and a die among the thorns. Along the road to Jericho, a man was left to die. There like a pastor from a rose to men had passed him by. A neighbor and a friend came by and saw his life scorned. With love he looked back with care to him, a rose among the thorns. One day among the world of thorns, a rose began to grow. It was the greatest gift of God this world will ever know. It was the will of God to show that since the world was formed, there had to be a rose among the thorns. Two thousand years will soon be gone since God looks down in love. There in Bethlehem, a rose began to bud. It lived to blossom until one day was crushed with awesome brows, and then with love from God above was moved to higher ground. One day among the world of thorns, a rose began to grow. It was the greatest gift of God this world will ever know. It was the gift of God to show that since the world was formed, there had to be a rose to live and die among the thorns. There had to be a rose to live and die among the thorns. Then in Jesus' sentence to be crucified in John 19, 1 through 6, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldier twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him with a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. One mo once more Pilate came out and said to, to the Jews, Look, I bring him to you to let you know I find no, for, no fault for a ch charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, Here is a man. As soon as the chief priests and their officers saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. I find no fault for a charge against him. Then in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, for I received from the Lord when I passed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, at the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for so much for loving us. And you showed that great love on the cross because you could have called 10,000 soldiers and destroyed the Romans, but you didn't. You died for us, Father. And we are Christian people are looking forward one day to be with you in heaven. 
And we pray until that time comes, we'll always serve you. Thank you, Father, for this time of morning that we can commune, think about your blood. You died on the cross for our sins. We just pray you be with us, and we just pray you forgive us for our sins. For this is my prayer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. I want to welcome all of those who are here in person, as well as those of you that are watching online. We are glad, as always, uh, for you to join us as well, and that we can share together in this moment today as we are in uh, this time of worship. The other day, I discovered a list from the job site Zipia.com. It's a job search site. Uh, that I had seen this, I'd seen this list shared online, and so I went to this list. It was a list of favorite Thanksgiving side dishes in each state, okay? So you take all 50 states, what's the, the favorite Thanksgiving side dish uh, in each state? And what they did is they, they, did, they conducted this research by looking at uh, Google Trends, okay? So you get into some of Google's analytics and things, and specifically what they wanted to know is they wanted to know, you know, what was the most a popular side item Google searched for last November, all right? So throughout the month of November 2019, in each particular state, which of the Thanksgiving side dishes were the most popular, most popularly searched for dishes, okay? And so first of all, I want to say this. When I was analyzing all the data and things that they had come together with, I want to say kudos to the research staff's decision to count gravy as a side dish all on its own. That was a good decision. <laughs> However, there's a problem. As you look at the map and things on their site, there's obviously a division between the brown gravy lovers of Wyoming, the white gravy lovers of Arkansas, and the turkey gravy lovers of Hawaii. Uh, so there's, you know, it's kind of all over the map, literally. My home state of Indiana was a disappointment. <laughs> With, it, with its preference toward deviled eggs. Did anyone here like deviled eggs? You guys are sick and twisted. Um, <laughs> oh, ugh. I cannot stay in deviled eggs, but I can't be surprised about it because deviled eggs appeared at nearly every church potluck and every family gathering of my entire life. So I can't be surprised that Indiana chose deviled eggs. I don't understand why someone would want to eat a spongy cooked egg with what yellow mush in the inside of it, but, you know, eh, to each his own. My wife's home state of Ohio, though, got it right, however. Uh, green bean casserole. Green bean casserole. I could eat a whole pan of green bean casserole all myself, and apparently six other states agreed, including, get this, Idaho. Idaho. <laughs> apparently... 
prefers green bean casserole over mashed potatoes, baked sweet potatoes, and sweet potato casserole. But I guess nobody in Idaho needs to be told how to make potatoes into a dish, right? Stuffing lovers appear to be mainly concentrated in the Northeast, except for New Hampshire, which loves their cranberry sauce, Connecticut, which loves their mashed potatoes, and Maine, with their preference for, wait a minute, side salad. Side salad. Really, Maine? Side salad. I think Maine needs to do some reflection in the mirror at this moment, or maybe that's just it. Maybe Maine has been doing some reflection in the mirror, and the rest of us need to do some reflecting in the mirror as well. Maybe we'd like side, the side salad a little more. So what about Kentucky? What about Kentucky? Apparently, we love our broccoli casserole. We were actually the only state in the entire union of all 50 whose predominant Google searches were for broccoli casserole. And I get it. It's good. It's not green bean casserole, but it's a strong second place contender. Here's the real question, though, and the reason I share all this. Why is a job or a job search site researching popular Thanksgiving side dishes? <laughs> Why is a, a, a career builder website researching popular Thanksgiving side dishes, and it's for this reason. And they said this in the article. Because this year, many companies are choosing not to have their stores open on Thanksgiving Day. As a matter of fact, for the first time in 30 years, Walmart will not be open on Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> and Marvin's like, yes. <laughs> and what that means is, for the first time in many years, some of these families will get to spend Thanksgiving meals with their families. And so the job search site, this, this very uh, career-oriented site, wanted to do a fun investigation and exploration of what meals these workers might get to enjoy with their families. And so that's why they were, they were doing the research. Jobs have kept some from the table at Thanksgiving for years. People who had to work for those earlier, seemingly earlier, earlier Black Friday sales and the different things going on. COVID-19 is going to keep some people from the table this year. But if we're honest... Some years, perhaps even this year, truly, uh, we're the ones that are keeping us from the table, truthfully. Maybe jobs, schedules, illnesses are something we've kind of used to provide, or they've just been there as a convenient cover from year to year to a reality that we fail to admit to ourselves or even to those around us, those we love, and that's this, that we've got beef with somebody that we are sitting at the Thanksgiving table with. We've got some sort of barrier between us that, you know, well, you know, I mean, and I'm not going to minimize the pandemic. I don't want to minimize that in any way. But truthfully, we get together for these family gatherings. Maybe it's Thanksgiving, it's Christmas, it's Fourth of July, or it's, it's uh, Memorial Day, whatever it is. And, you know, there's always that person maybe in the family or in that group of friends we get together with where our personalities just, they, they clash. Or there's been some sort of, uh, you know, uh, there's been some sort of uh, hurt that's been caused between us and so it just makes getting together all that more difficult. And so something like a job comes along, you know, oh, we got to work. We got to find people to work today. Oh, well, you know, sign me up. I'll work today. I'll work on Thanksgiving. We may find those excuses. Michael J. Wilkins shares the story of a man by the name of Tom Terrence. Tom is a former segregationist who participated in the violent activities of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1960s and 1970s. But Tom met Jesus Christ as his savior in a Mississippi prison cell. The transformation of his life is miraculous as, he, as his hatred was replaced by love and his bigotry was replaced with reconciliation. And together with John Perkins, who was a former black activist, they've written together this book entitled He's My Brother, which not only shares their stories, but also presents a workable strategy for building bridges of understanding and reconciliation between peoples of varying backgrounds and colors. But their unwavering message in this, get this, their unwavering message is, and this is my point today with sharing it, is that racial reconciliation is impossible until individuals on both sides experience the mercy and forgiveness of God for their personal sin, which will create a community of faith based in the reconciling work of Jesus Christ. Did you catch what I'm saying there? What they're saying is this. That, you know, we look around us and we see all these different divisions and we see all these things. We can look at racial division. We can look at political division. We can look at all these other things that divide us in our culture. We can look at things that divide us in our country or in our, and in our families and things. And their point is this, that reconciliation truly 
really isn't possible in the way we want it to be until each of us comes to terms with personally how God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, our Savior. When we come to the understanding of what Jesus has done, the depth of what Jesus has done, that we just celebrated through Danny's meditation and through the Lord's Supper, when we come to terms with what Jesus has done for us, then all of a sudden that really opens doors to how we begin to reconcile ourselves with other people. Wilkins shares the following story about his own life. A few years ago when bumper stickers were popular, one he says stood out to me. I don't get mad, I get even. I don't get mad, I get even. You see that bumper sticker? It was meant to be humorous, but he says it had a chilling effect on me because it described to a T my attitude just a few years prior to the moment I saw it. He says, I was raised by a stepfather who caused my family and me a great deal of pain. He left our family when I was in my early teens, and I carried a deep animosity toward him for years. He said, when I was in Vietnam, my animosity became almost obsessive. I vowed, he said, for the first, that the first time I saw him upon my return to the States, I would kill him. That's how deep the animosity and the obsessiveness came. He said, I would make him pay for what he had done to our family. So I returned a few months later, and within a year, he said, I became a Christian. And then my world began to change, and I put that stepfather out of my mind. I'd not thought very much about him until about four years later when he suddenly showed up in my life where my wife and I and our little girl were living. He'd actually tracked us down. My wife, he says, being the loving person that she is, invited him in. And as we sat and talked very politely, that vow came back to my mind. And then I told him, he says, I made a vow in Vietnam that the first time I saw you, I'd kill you. And today is that day. And he says, I will never forget the look of terror that came over his face. He started to sweat and he started to slide down on the couch. But then I continued. But now I know that I'm no better a person than you. I will not allow you to hurt my family again. So don't think that this is made out of weakness. Rather, I forgive you because I have been forgiven. He said, I was probably as shocked as he was. I had not thought about saying those words of forgiveness, but they came easily. I was deeply aware of the mercy and forgiveness that God had extended to me. I discovered that the key to forgiveness is to stop focusing on what others have done to us and focus instead on what Jesus has done for us. What if the healing that we so desire to see for our world today and our families today, what if that healing is directly related, directly correlated to how much we've allowed God to heal us? What if healing this world begins with healing our relationship with God? What if healing this world begins with healing our relationship with others as a result of that, allowing all to have a place at the table? I want you to turn with me today to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, we're going to read a familiar passage here today. Uh, the one that we've read before, but I think we'll have some new insights for us today. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, and here's what Jesus says. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What Jesus is essentially saying here is that when you walk through this process of reconciliation, of trying to reconcile a person, uh, whatever the end result of that, if you're faithful to that process, if you're faithful to what I'm laying out here, I'm going to honor the result. He's gonna, I'm going to honor that what comes from that if it's reconciliation or if it's that estrangement. He says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, and this is in the context of this conversation here that he's having, about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. 
And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have also had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, Jesus says, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. There's a lot here. This passage, this passage truly centers on one topic. One topic. And we might be tempted to say forgiveness, and forgiveness is a part of it, but actually there's something that's a prerequisite to forgiveness. This word like the, the, the linchpin, the fulcrum in the middle of this passage, and it's this, it's repentance. Repentance. There's a lot we can say, and we've, we've talked about this passage in the past. We can say a lot about Matthew 18. But there are two particular basic points that we really need to drill home today on the topic of, you know, kind of coming back and bringing reconciliation, coming back to the table together. And before we get into though, I, all, that also, I want to remind us of one thing we talked about last week, and that's this, that all this teaching of Jesus right now is happening in the shadow of teaching he's already done about the cross. So last week, you know, we talked about humility, which humility uh, had a big part at the cross. What Jesus is saying here, after he's talked about the cross, he's saying, okay, now here's how you interact with each other. Interact with each other with humility. And now he's saying interact with repentance. Repentance and forgiveness. These are all, that's an outgrowth. Really, when we understand the weight of what happened at the cross, I mean, we saw a humble Savior go to the cross, and then we see what he did, and the weight of what he did, and what it means for us, the natural reaction that we have to that should be what? Repentance. That's the natural outgrowth of Calvary. Craig Blomberg lays out clearly the two main points of Jesus' teaching here in his commentary on Matthew, and I just want to share those with you here briefly. Number one, forgiveness is withheld without repentance. Forgiveness is withheld without repentance. Verses 15 through 20 center on a very hard but necessary truth that there can be really no forgiveness, no true restoration to any relationship, especially among brothers and sisters within the church, uh, where harm has been done and that offending party has not repented, which meaning they have not turned the corner. They have not tried to turn and walk a different path than the one that they were walking before and they caused so much uh, of the maybe pain or the hurt or the offense. So what Jesus does here is he outlines a path toward repentance and that path not only toward repentance but toward re restoration as well. And I think we should really note that here. Okay, what Jesus here isn't giving us permission to do is exact retribution, okay? Uh, this isn't an opportunity for humiliating another person. It's not an opportunity for exacting revenge and, and, and really kind of getting our digs in. The whole point for the procedure that Jesus outlines is maximizing the potential for restoring the relationship in the end. The goal is rehabilitation, not retribution. And that's why God then gives it his endorsement there in verses 18 to 20. He says, when you follow it with proper intent, I'm going to honor the result of that process. One important piece of ensuring the greatest potential for conviction and repentance in these kinds of situations where you have to bring, you confront someone uh, that maybe has caused offense or things. One of the important pieces of this is involving as few people as necessary in the process. Involving as few people as necessary. Because here's what it does. It, pr it promotes a, an atmosphere of safety for the person being accused or to, whom you're trying to bring conviction to. You know, what happens when, you know, you've got people, maybe you've been in this or maybe this happened to you in school or growing up, and you've got people that want to confront you about something or something, and they come, and it's like a group of people that come at you. What's, what's the natural reaction? It's like, okay, I'm getting backed into a corner here. We put up defensive walls. Instead of, instead of being you know, sort of more open to saying, okay, what, what do they have to tell me? What kind of truth is there in this? And even at that, there may be a little defensiveness, one-to-one, -one, but you increase the chances of there being an openness when you go one-on-one. -on -one. 
Okay? And so that prevents them as, from feeling as though they need to take a defensive posture here. Can I also make another observation, observation here as well? Some of us are reluctant to confess and repent of sin because we're afraid to see the hurt that it caused another person. Can I share a scripture with you, though, this morning? Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You're only as sick as your secrets. We're only as sick as our secrets. And yeah, it may hurt to see the hurt that we've caused another person, but you know what? Our soul needs the forgiveness that they might offer if we would do so. And the only way to receive that forgiveness is to let that person process through the hurt, to go through their process with God of reconciling that with God and getting to the point where they may be ready to forgive. Now, whether they forgive or not is totally between them and God. We can't dictate that. We have no way to, to kind of make that happen. But when we come with repentance and when we're willing, even though we have, it may cause us to have to confront the hurt, and that's hard to do, we are offering a runway. We are making a runway for forgiveness to happen, for it to become a possibility. Our soul needs it, and so does theirs. Number two, though, so forgiveness is withheld without repentance, but number two, forgiveness is unlimited with repentance. Forgiveness is unlimited with repentance. So, so on this teaching of Jesus, Peter responds, and he responds with what he thinks is a very generous response. You know, Jesus is saying, you know, how, he's talking about this forgiveness. He says, so how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? And he says, up to seven times? And he, you know, this is a really kind of, uh, he, he just thinks he's being a very uh, pious person. Of course, just a few passages earlier, Jesus has talked about how Peter's kind of going to stand out in the church, and, and he's kind of seemed to elevate Peter a little bit. And so maybe Peter's thinking, well, now's my moment to show my prowess, and I'm going to come up here and, you know, really kind of wow people with my spiritual insight. So he's up to seven times, and it, and it makes sense, because seven... Uh, why Peter's thinking what he's thinking, because seven is the number of completeness in the Bible. So what, Je what Peter's really saying is, you know, the complete amount of times, whatever brings completeness, you know, ha-ha, looky there, what a spiritual insight. It's also the number that exceeded the teaching of the rabbis at the time. The rabbis at the time were saying up to three times. All you had to do was just forgive somebody three times, and then that was, that was enough, you'd done your duty. Jesus' reply, though, likely stunned Peter. Not seven but 77 times. And what was Jesus' point when he said that? According to Craig Blomberg, he says, we dare not keep track of the number of times we grant forgiveness. We dare not keep track of the number of times we grant forgiveness. Forgiveness is unlimited with repentance because that's what God does. When we repent, God, God forgives. What then follows is this powerful illustration of a king who's very generous with his forgiveness and a forgiven person who's then not in the story, the main character is this man who owes 10,000 talents to the king. The talent, to understand what Jesus is doing when he's using this language in this story, the, the talent was the highest known denomination uh, of money or currency in the Roman Empire at that time. Okay, So the talent, it says it's as high as you can go in denominations of money. All right, So the talent is, is huge. Ten, the word 10,000 also, as far as numbers were concerned, it was the highest known uh, numerical number uh, in the Greek language at the time. Okay, so Jesus is going to the, the, the real extreme of how big this debt is. As a matter of fact, the phrase 10,000 in the Greek is the word from which we derive our word myriad. Uh, that's where that word comes from. And so the God's, what Jesus is saying here is he's trying to get this picture of how big this debt is. This is like a lifetime's worth of debt. Uh, estimates in modern currency would range from $7 million to $1 trillion is where kind of people are, are thinking as far as how much this could represent in today's dollars. So the debt is huge. It's obviously huge to the audience. It would have taken maybe even several lifetimes to pay it off back through servitude, which is what they were getting paid in. They were going to be sent into servitude. But the man begs for mercy. He repents, as we talked about just a minute ago, and the king, who's moved by the heartfelt pleas of this man, completely forgives the debt. He says, you know, I cannot cause this family, I cannot allow this family to go and to live the rest of their lives in servitude. He says, I've got to do something. I'm going to release them from this burden. And so he says, I'm just going to forgive the debt. It's huge. It is just pure grace, pure grace. 
So the man receives this great gift, and he walks outside the room and the throne room, and after he gets outside the throne room, he runs into one of his fellow servants who owes him 100 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. So what this man owed, 100 denarii, was 100 days' wages. It wasn't anything to laugh at, but in comparison to what this man just got forgiven himself, it is a paltry amount of money. I mean, it's, it's just like the ratio here is like 6,000 to 1 or, or, uh, or um, a 1 million to 1 uh, of the, by comparison. So it's just no comparison at all. And what was his response? He chokes the man. The man who utters almost the exact same words that he himself had uttered to the king. He chokes him and demands repayment. The word here for he refused literally means that he was not willing. He made a willful decision to not do what the king had done for him. A conscious choice to harden his heart. And when the king finds out that the man refused to extend the same grace that had been given to him, he's furious, and he orders the man to essentially serve that life sentence in the end anyway. Blomberg concludes this way. He says the point of the parable is simple. God's grace is boundless. Spurning that grace is absurd. And the fate of the unforgiving is frightful. D.A. Carson, in his commentary on Matthew, stated this. He says, Jesus sees no incongruity in the actions of a heavenly Father who forgives so bountifully and punishes so ruthlessly, and neither should we. Indeed, it is precisely because he is a God of such compassion and mercy that he cannot possibly accept as his those devoid of compassion and mercy. Every time there is repentance, our forgiveness, folks, should be as abundant as God's is to us. Every time there is repentance from someone in our lives, our forgiveness should be as abundant and plentiful as uh, as God's forgiveness is toward us. Here's our big point today, and we're going to close. Unlock a limitless feast for yourself and for others at God's table through repentance. Unlock a limitless feast of forgiveness and mercy and healing for yourself and for others at God's table through repentance. Repentance. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the great and abundant grace that is ours through Jesus Christ. Lord, it's a large part of the reason why we come together here because it only strengthens and deepens and intensifies our love for you. At the same time, Lord, it's so easy for us to be short-sighted and to see what we receive and neglect what we're to give. Lord, there's an inconsistency there. An inconsistency that that you're wanting to, to shine a spotlight on today. Not so that there can be judgment in the end, although certainly there can be for that. Lord, ultimately what you want is you want us to find healing. You want us to see the, the inconsistency. You want us to see, uh, Lord, that, uh, that uh, need in our own lives so that it can be healed, so that we can be restored, so that we can be even closer with you, so that we can even be a, have a louder testimony for you, a more powerful testimony for you in this world. Because right now, as we said at the outset, Lord, the world needs to understand reconciliation. And for the world to understand it, the people that you've commissioned to, to bring that message have to understand it as well. Lord, the church has to understand it. We have to understand it. We have to practice it. We have to live it. So, Father, help us do that. Today, Lord, may we be reconciled to you. Uh, Lord, by giving our, if we haven't given our life to you and given our life to your son Jesus as our Savior, it's our prayer today that we would do so, that those here would do so who need to make that decision. Uh, Father, at the same time, maybe we have done that, we've made that step, but there's still that inconsistency and we're not maybe living the way closely to your example as we should. Father, may you illuminate the path for us. Help us to find our way closer to you so that we can honor you more with our lives. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for the amazing and abundant grace that allows us a place at the table that we don't really even deserve, Lord. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, 
If you're here and you have a decision to make, we want to encourage you to stay in your seat after the service and someone will follow up with you. One of our staff or leadership will follow up with you about that decision. If you're online watching with us today and you have a decision you'd like to make, you want to know more about getting a relationship with Jesus Christ, we encourage you to reach out to us through a private message on the Facebook page or just to send a message to us at, at office at nschristianchurch.org and we'd love to follow up with you this week as well. Uh, with that, though, let's go ahead and stand together and let's sing our song of decision as we begin to close our service today. paid in the low, the grace of giving. Uh, we encourage you to give. There's a box at the uh, back of the room for those of you that are here in person. And uh, of course, God has been honoring your gifts. You know, there's so many opportunities we had through all of this to really give and be a blessing to others. Uh, that's really what's been amazing, I think, throughout this whole time. And so God is using everything we give, our time, our resources and things to honor him. So I encourage you to participate in that online. You can also do that through the uh, nschristianchurch.org, the donate tab there. Also, you can send to our P.O. box there that's listed on the screen. I also want to uh, just call, draw your attention to, you know, last week I mentioned about some food donations that we were going to be uh, partnering with the school system uh, to provide. And uh, our ladies' ministry is actually coordinating that. We've got a, a two or three uh, meals there that they're going to provide to some families in need through Scott County High School. And so that is going on. I appreciate the Wings Ministry stepping up to, to do that. Also, though, in addition, and we know a lot of you probably want to give, and it, you know, there, there's a lot of need in our community. And so one of the things we're also doing is we're uh, going to try to help Amen House uh, with the food baskets that they are trying to put together. Uh, their goal is to actually get 100 more of those than what they currently have supplies for. Uh, there's the items they need are listed on the screen. There's also some uh, signage, I think, that lists that out in, the, out in the foyer as well. Nick's Notes, I had that in Nick's Notes as well. And you can go to Amen House's Facebook page, and they've got the list there uh, for you to look at. But what we encourage people to do, if you would, to give what you can, if you can bring those donations in here by next Sunday. 
Uh, we've got the, the rack sitting out in the foyer now, actually, and you can just put them on that shelf, and we'll get those food donations to aim in-house so that they can get those baskets put together in time for Thanksgiving. And so we encourage you to bring those items. The only thing they said that they don't need is they don't need uh, cornbread. The things that they listed originally on to people that were following them on Facebook, they've got like thousands of baskets worth of cornbread. So uh, maybe cornbread should be on the top of the sides in Kentucky this year. I don't know, but uh, as far as what the popular sides are, but please, uh, we encourage you to help with those food donations. Again, thanks to the women's ministry wings for taking on the, the stuff with the school and, and helping with this as well. Encourage everyone to participate with that. Also want to encourage uh, our guys in the congregation, our ladies already started their Bible study a couple weeks ago, but Alan Luzier is starting a men's small group this coming uh, Tuesday. It's meeting every other week starting this Tuesday, November 17th, 7.30 p.m. here at the church. They'll be observing social distancing. It'll be a safe place to be, uh, but they'll be meeting here at the church building coming this Tuesday evening at 7.30. So I encourage you. Alan's actually in the back back there wearing the green shirt there. And so if you want to ask him about that, guys. Uh, feel free to, to ask him about that. I'm sure he would love to tell you about what's going on there. Appreciate his work. And uh, Rebecca's with the ladies group getting those things together. With that, that's all we've got announcement-wise. Wayne, if you'd close us with a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Thanks. Father, we, uh, I don't think, ever fully realize the grace and the love that you have shown for us in the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we uh, need to take to heart the message that Jesus gave us in the passage in Matthew this week. Uh, forgiveness. But coupled along with that is our own repentance. So Father, help us to uh, work through both of those as we head out into this week and to love people with the love that Jesus has for all of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please be seated and you'll be dismissed by pew. Thank you.